Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Shiba Wan, Dean at the Universal Library. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the University of Cincinnati. We are here today to celebrate two truly exceptional gifts to the UC libraries. The thesis of John Toff James, UC's first graduate, and his correspondence with Thomas Jefferson from 1820. On behalf of the UC Libraries, I'd like to thank you for joining us for this unveiling of this significant gift. A special note of gratitude to the Eaton family, who traveled from three areas of the countries to be here with us today. The University of Cincinnati Libraries has committed to a bold vision to become a globally engaged intellectual commons of the university. To see this vision fulfilled, we build our strategic plan around the four themes which we refer as the pillars. Digital technology and innovation, people, space, and data to information to knowledge. It is that final pillars that bring us here today, data to information to knowledge. It is about transforming our connections, including special connections, like the remarkable items we are accepting today, and enabling new and exciting modes of scholarship. To UC libraries, this means improving access to our materials, expanding our connections, and preserving what we have. To the University of Cincinnati, it means enhanced capability, integrating library connections into research and project, and dynamic interactions with library's resources to construct new knowledge, develop initiative, innovative ideas, and contribute to scholarship. To the donors, like the Eaton family, it's about providing a home to unique and historical gift, like this one, and increasing visibility and accessibility to scholars at the UC and beyond. So thank you, family. It's now my great pleasure to welcome to the podium the UC Foundation President, Mr. Ra Gorbatsky. Ra. Thank you, Shimo. And it really is my pleasure to be here today. I just had a wonderful time, you know, the past 10 minutes visiting with the family. Uh, one of the connections that uh, we have, honestly, is a passion for uh, history and ancestry. So uh, we've been talking about uh, doing our family. I do my family tree, and uh, the Eaton family obviously also has a passion for their family tree. And with this donation of a couple of items that go back to our university's history, you think about this, is that the diploma that uh, we have up here, 1821, this university started in 1819, so the first graduate of the university to be able to have a diploma, but uh, here now is part of our archives. But you think about the status of the university and the status of Cincinnati back in the early 1800s and this country. There is so much history that is represented here with these documents that uh, I hope that everyone really understands the historical significance that it means for the university to have these rare archives. And so before I get uh, much further into the program, I, I wanted to invite um, our, uh, someone who is a graduate of the University of Cincinnati, who served also as the Dean of the Conservatory of Music, and now serves as our interim provost, uh, uh, Peter Langren to come up and say a few words of welcome. Peter. Thanks, Rod. It's good to be here on day four of my <laughs> interim <laughs> program. Um, I 
can't wait for day five, especially you know, if, if we have uh, something as glorious as truly this celebration here. Um, as Rod said, the university is about to celebrate its, uh, uh, its bicentennial in 2019. The fact that the family is coming forward here for something that truly I think our university is going to be able to point to through our multi-year celebration of the bicentennial uh, to be able to say that this is the true roots of the University of Cincinnati uh, uh, and the connections uh, that it has with the city itself. Uh, I, I, I too, like Rod, had a great time uh, talking with the family beforehand and really understanding their connection to this historic piece and the fact that this is truly something that's been held in the family for its entirety. And this is now the first hand over it, of it to the University of Cincinnati. is truly an exceptional thing uh, for us to be able to accept. Um, so thank you very much to, to everyone, uh, all of you, for being here, and uh, let's go on to day five and day six. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. We gather today to say thank you to Russell Eaton, James Eaton, Francis Eaton Milhauser, the great grandchildren, of, excuse me, the great great grandchildren of John Huff James. They are truly making a priceless gift to the University of Cincinnati. Kevin Grace will speak in greater detail on the historical significance of these two documents. But suffice to say, it's not every day that you can read a thesis on a Revolutionary War hero complete with research conducted using first-person interviews. Nor is it every day that you can read correspondence between the first graduate of UC and one of America's founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson. After today, these documents, this gift, belongs to the people of Cincinnati, this region, and our nation. Both documents provide an important window into our collective past. Speaking this morning on behalf of the University of Cincinnati Foundation, let me convey our enthusiasm and gratitude for this gift, for the continuing support of the Eaton family. Gifts to our special collections and to the UC archives truly are priceless. And you happen to know that because you're a librarian here with the university, so you know what this means. We treasure these kinds of gifts for the value they bring to our university because they provide a greater understanding of who we are and remind us of the important place UC holds in our nation's history. While much of the Foundation's focus is on developing and growing the university's private financial resources, we also play a role in the facilitating the acquisition of gifts in kind and gifts of historical items. In both cases, UC's faculty and students benefit from the ongoing mission of the Foundation. Over the years, uh, we've had the privilege of working with our next speaker when acquiring items for the UC Archives. It's my pleasure today to introduce the leader of the Archives and Rare Books Library. Please welcome Kevin Grace. Thanks very much. Uh, the last time I spoke in this lobby, uh, actually stood on the stairs was in 2005, 11 years ago, when we celebrated the 75th anniversary of this building. And Lincoln Library is one of the hidden Art Deco treasures of Cincinnati. All the architectural design work extols the history of the book and the valuable heritage of education. And above you, for instance, is a bronze chandelier in which the hieroglyphic characters read, Be not proud because of thy knowledge, be not puffed up because of thy manual skill, no art can be wholly mastered. No man can attain perfection in manual skill. And hanging just inside the front doors there, uh, where you entered, is another chandelier, this time with a Japanese proverb. It says, there are no age limits to learning. Anyone can learn anything if he studies it a hundred times. So it kind of contradicts the fact. <laughs> uh, when all this was designed, it was actually all the faculty of UC coming together from different departments. And uh, so it was one of those few instances where everybody agreed the building should be beautiful. Uh, there are other, and speaking of that, I do want to thank our um, uh, facilities at UC and housekeeping for making the lobby so beautiful this morning and polishing the railing and waxing the floor and really keeping up uh, this building. Well, anyway, there are other chandeliers in this building, too, with similar sentiments in Greek and Latin, uh, Hebrew and Chinese. And these proverbs 
are appropriate to this occasion today because they exemplify Thomas Jefferson's approach to education and knowledge, which are two separate things, but our humanist hope is that one will lead to another in a continuing cycle. And I should mention, too, regarding the decorations on this building, that on the exterior pylons are reliefs of famous printers in the Western world, one of whom can be found on the north corner of the building, and that's the Benjamin Franklin. And that, too, is appropriate to our gathering here today, because Franklin and Jefferson are America's two shining exemplars of the Age of Enlightenment. On the other side of the Atlantic were luminaries like Descartes and Diderot, Voltaire and Rousseau, and Adam Smith and David Hume, and Samuel Johnson and Alexander Pope. And on our side of the ocean, there were Franklin and Jefferson. So the Age of Enlightenment was exactly that, an age that sought new understanding in the sciences and in religion, in philosophy and in politics, and in literature and the entire process of learning. For Thomas Jefferson, universities were essential for enlightenment, that is, discourse, argument, postulate, and proof. So tradition can be a strong and vibrant quality, and in libraries it remains true that they function as both fortress and cathedral, duties thus performed that I believe would meet with Jefferson's approval. They protect books and knowledge from the trepidations of those who would destroy access to it, and they celebrate and honor the contents that allow it. So libraries are the foundation of universities. In 1819, the University of Virginia, Jefferson's University, was founded. And in 1819, Cincinnati College was founded, and John Huff James began his advanced search for knowledge. The college did not have a library then, other than the personal ones of faculty and students, but the students had access to the collection of the Cincinnati Public Library. So John James took it upon himself to further that and write to Thomas Jefferson in 1820 for information, that is for knowledge, about his subject, the Polish general who served America in the Revolutionary War, today is Kosciuszko. Kosciuszko led an exciting, albeit checkered life, as a soldier, patriot, mercenary, and he contributed in a significant way to the success of the American troops. So Jefferson became James's librarian in a manner of speaking. He became a resource or an information broker for John James through his courtesy in replying, and though Jefferson could provide only a few details about Kosciuszko, he could refer James to the biography written about the general by the Polish French soldier Julian Ursi Niemowicz, published that year in 1820. Niemowicz served under Kosciuszko as his aide de camp during the Krakow uprising against the Russian occupation in Poland in 1794 and was subsequently imprisoned in Russia. Jefferson also thought that perhaps James could contact the French officers who aided the Continental Forces, in particular the Marquis de Lafayette, and he could plumb their memories as well. There's also a reference in this Jefferson letter in his response to James to a General Armstrong of New York. This is a reference that bears further research, as there were multiple Armstrongs involved in the war, so it's unclear to whom exactly Jefferson is referring. Much of uh, Kosciuszko's military success was in fact in New York at the Battle of Saratoga and later at West Point. So this brings up another interesting facet about the letter. Kosciuszko had died in Switzerland in 1817, and as Jefferson was his friend, in his will he requested that Jefferson act as the executor of his American estate. Jefferson declined. And this may be why he was not entirely forthcoming to John James about his intimate knowledge of Kosciuszko. Because as it turns out, there were multiple wills, and the litigation over them became quite contentious. Jefferson may have desired to stay above the fray as possible. Curiously, too, there was one litigant and supposed heir whose name was Kosciuszko Armstrong. Uh, it's a hell of a thing to learn how to spell in the first grade. <laughs> so that brings us back to this unspecified general named Armstrong he mentioned in Jefferson's letter. So to John Huff James, and his education here in our city. At the time James attended Cincinnati College, Cincinnati was still a fairly new settlement on the Ohio River, just three decades old, but it was exploding in possibility. Jeff James and his fellow students had to apply by examination to be admitted to any particular course, and they had to have a fairly good knowledge of Greek and Latin. The students lived in boarding houses in the college in the city basin on 4th Street, and faculty administrators were required to regularly visit these living quarters to make sure the students were not compromising their morals. 
so that was a very interesting task. Um, with the faculty's permission, however, students were permitted to keep liquor in their rooms and to visit local taverns. Interestingly enough, when William Holmes McDuffie became president of Cincinnati College in 1836, he came down from Miami University and immediately told parents not to send their children to Miami because they would become drunkards. <laughs> so, uh, in deference to your Miami education, we'll revisit this uh, topic on September 24th when we play Miami football. <laughs> So, more to the point of morality, I guess, that students were forbidden to read any indecent or irreligious books, however those were defined, and Jefferson might have rankled at something like that. In James's senior year at Cincinnati College, he was required to study natural philosophy, astronomy, logic, moral philosophy, composition, literature, and oratory. And on September 26, 1821, he graduated from Cincinnati College along with Frederick A. Kemper and William Henry Harrison, Jr., whose father was one of the college's trustees. In James's diploma that we have here today, and which was donated to UC in the 1950s, uh, because Julia Langsam, the wife of uh, our president, then Walter Langsam, was a descendant of uh, the James family as well. And the signature of William Henry Harrison, Sr., uh, the future president of the United States, can be seen in the lower right corner of that document. Of these first three graduates, Kemper gave the salutatory address, and James gave the valedictorian speech, which was entitled Literature and Science. And this title probably would have piqued Thomas Jefferson's interest as well. In the words of the Cincinnati College president, the Reverend Elijah Slack, these three graduates were, quote, the first fruits of the institution. So what about Cincinnati College today? It's the institution to which we trace our founding as the University of Cincinnati. Though UC itself was created in 1870, it's truly a university of the city in every way because it's a confederacy of the best in education as we've absorbed the colleges that are part of the city of Cincinnati's legacy. We are the University of Cincinnati because of Cincinnati College, and its legacy is one of research, teaching, innovation, and service. In truth, we've grown from a frontier college on the early streets of a river city to what today are the global reaches of higher education. So we owe our immense presence in this particular campus world to that world of Cincinnati College, Thomas Jefferson, and John Huff James. And the gift of this letter and thesis this morning is a gift that will lead to a greater understanding of our place in the world and what we make of it. The Jefferson letter and the James thesis will find a place beyond their physical location in the archives and rare books library because they will extend to teaching in the classroom and research in scholarly offices and because they will be digitized, resulting extension that will be well beyond the campus borders of the University of Cincinnati. And that's the legacy we strive for with unique gifts such as these. It's a Jeffersonian legacy because, as you well know, we have the Library of Congress, one of the greatest repositories of books and knowledge in the history of humankind because of Thomas Jefferson. As he wrote to James Madison in 1821, another University of Virginia person, Books constitute capital. A library book lasts as long as a house for hundreds of years. It is not then an article of mere consumption, but fairly of capital. For us here at the University of Cincinnati, that capital is education. As we approach the bicentennial of UC in a few short years, we look to make our renowned institution a destination for students and scholars from around the world as part of their education, and gifts such as these help make this happen. So in closing, there are two other proverbs that should be noted, one of which is not in this building, but is on the front of McMicken Hall. And that is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 7. And carved into the front of McMicken Hall is this. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And on another chandelier in this building in Chinese, libraries are valuable to readers because they preserve the riches of the world from which come the beginning of wisdom. Everything in the heavens or upon the earth is for our appreciation. So Thomas Jefferson and I think John James and his descendants sitting here today would embrace these lessons on life. Over the years, I've had the good fortune to occasionally study rare books at Thomas Jefferson's university. The director of the rare book school there, Michael Suarez, has said that a book is a confluence of endeavors. The author, the papermaker, the typesetter, the designer, the printer, the binder, and especially the reader 
all bring the book to fruition. And these gifts are at the points of endeavors as well, from their creators, from the Eaton and Milhauser family, and from the good folks here at the University of Cincinnati to bring something extraordinary to fruition, enlightenment and the engagement to learning. Thank you. First, I would like to thank <coughs> excuse me, the University of Cincinnati for the hospitality they've shown us and the kind remarks, with maybe a few exceptions of about some remarks about my university. <laughs> However, this is a great experience. My siblings and I are pleased to present to the University of Cincinnati our cherished family possessions of John Huff James, our great-great-grandfather, the valedictorian of the university's first class. Uh, in addition to the possessions uh, that are shown here, we are also giving uh, a certificate, John H. James membership in one of the lo lo local uh, fire companies, volunteer fire companies, and also a piece of correspondence from James to the Philomathic Society that he was a member of. We have always considered ourselves custodians of these items, and we would ultimately return them to, to the university. We feel strongly that this is the appropriate time for us to give these gifts back to the university. So they can join J.H.J.'s diploma, which our father presented to President Lang Sam nearly 50 years, 60 years ago. Furthermore, our enjoyment is complete knowing that all of our gifts are in the university's very safe hands and will be enjoyed by the UC community forever. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce my brother James Eaton, who will some reflections on JHJ, John Huff James. Thank you, Russell. I gotta clarify one point. Russell Eaton, James Eaton, Francis Eaton, Milhauser, all have their undergraduate degrees from Miami University. <laughs> <laughs> our graduate degrees are a little spread out, but we, did, we all did our undergraduate work there. And that reflects on John James, too, because uh, Ophia and uh, W.E. Smith wrote the Buckeye Titan, which is the book about John Huff James. And he had a great deal of influence on our parents and uh, took us to Miami many times. And I, I think it was sort of by default that we went to Miami in our, in our formative years. So, okay. John Huff James was a lawyer, a banker, a railroad builder, a scientific farmer, a stock breeder, a legislator, a politician, an editor, a lecturer, and a writer. And that's a mouthful. In 1821, he was a senior in college here, and he began to keep a diary. And he continued that until his death in 1881. He graduated from, University, from Cincinnati College uh, September 29, 1821. He was first in his class. Frederick Kemper was second, and William Henry Harrison, Jr. was third. He wrote in his diary after he gave his talk, I did rather better than I expected, and I am flattered with having drawn tears from some of the ladies and some of my fellow students. I have the honor of being the first graduate of Cincinnati College, and though I leave it with highest honors it can bestow, I leave it with regret. Before, however, before he graduated from Cincinnati College, he began to write for the Cincinnati newspapers and literary magazines. He fully expected to combine a literary career with his professional practice as a lawyer. He had been a keen, he had a keen historical sense and was a great writer. Methodically, he recorded in his diary the historical anecdotes he heard on his travels. 
He lived in a time when he could converse with men who had known George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, John Marshall, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and military and civic leaders in the early West. He wrote down the recollections of old men who had helped build the new country. His memoirs on Simon Kenton and the Logan brothers in Middle Ohio were quite, quite interesting. His correspondence show a wide range of interests. James was a collector of documents, manuscripts, books, pamphlets, newspapers, periodicals, and as I can tell you, when my brother and I worked very hard in the James Mansion when it was taken apart, nothing had ever been thrown away in 130 years. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> it took a long time to go through 24 rooms and, and, and get that cleaned up. Few men of the West kept so complete a record of the times in which they lived. The James Library was considered one of the finest private libraries in the West. It contained thousands of carefully selected books in rare Americana. <clears throat> it's now at Miami University. <clears throat> Oxford, Ohio. <laughs> Along with the diaries. John H. James was a personal friend of Henry Clay, Tom Corbin, William Henry Harrison, Sr. and Jr., and many other prominent Whigs of the West. He was schooled in the intricate policy politics of Ohio and was powerful as an advisor to the Whig leaders in Congress and the General Assembly of Ohio. Possessing unbounded faith in the West, James took great financial risks in banking, land speculating, and railroading. His father, Levi James, was, had also taken considerable risks in steamboating on the western waters. The mind of John James was never bound by the old or the familiar. Always he grasped the possibilities of the new and untried. In his lifetime, he witnessed the coming of the steamboat, the canal, the railroad, the telegraph, and the Atlantic Cable. James also founded Urbana University in Urbana, Ohio in 1850 which is still a respected educational institution. After the death of Henry Clay, John James found himself as a man without a party. He was neither a Democrat nor a Republican. During the Civil War, he was accused of being a copperhead. Those charges were absolutely false. Russell and I can also attest to that because as children, we loved to go to the third floor of the James house which was well stocked with many, many, many Civil War rifles and other artifacts. As the family tradition has it, John James paid for the armament of the 26th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. And there's lots more stories there, but I won't do that. In his resistance to war policies, which he felt were unconstitutional, he represented a substantial number of the people in the strife ridden 1860s. In 1863, he classified his own correspondence and that of his family, a mass of letters that had accumulated since probably 1800 and before to 1863. James left a lasting legacy in the progress in banking, law, railroading, education, and in land development. We, as a family, are delighted to honor his accomplishments with the donation of the Jefferson Letter, as it's always been known in the family, to the University of Cincinnati. Thank you very much, and I'd like to introduce my sister, Frances Milhauser. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I would like to express a special thank you to Krista for her hospitality and guiding us through every step of the whole process of the donation.
My older brothers are the historians, and um, I'm more interested in genealogy, but as it relates to history. So I'm going to talk a little bit about John Huff James's father, because once I started re researching Levi James, I just became fascinated with his life. And it reminds me of that, who would you invite to dinner if you could invite anyone? And it would be Levi James and John Huff James, and Abby Bailey, John Huff James's wife. Levi James was born in Virginia, so I especially like the fact that Ohio and Virginia are linked not only in my life, but also in the life of the Jameses. Levi was born in 1776 in Loudoun County, which is the one county over from where I live today in Fairfax County. In 1786, his father died and left the children and the wife with no support. So. Levi James had a very humble beginning in his life, and in fact, at age 14, he was apprenticed out to learn the, the trade of a saddler. Um, he was lucky that he didn't get apprenticed out to learn the trade of a tanner, because that was a really nasty job. Saddlery was hard enough. And all of his siblings were apprenticed out, either to become a cabinet maker, maker the tanner, and, and uh, Levi's job, and then the sisters were also apprenticed out. Women and girls were apprenticed out only to learn household duties. They did not get an education. Levi was apprenticed to a Quaker in Waterford, Virginia, Asa Moore, who was a well, -known, well known in Waterford. And the Quakers believed so strongly in education that, um, and I think we can tell this from his future life, he received a very good education. He finished his apprenticeship and he married a Quaker woman, Rachel Huff, which is where the Huff in John Huff James comes from. Um, she fell in love with him and left the Quaker community to marry him. They were not married, they ran away to get married and then moved to Occoquan, Virginia, where he had a saddlery shop. That's where John Huff James was born, um, in Occoquan, Virginia, which is south of, in Prince William County, south of Fairfax County, so all of that. Um, he then moved his shop, it was very successful, but he then moved to Alexandria, Virginia, and there I found an ad in one of the newspapers from the time that his, his saddlery shop was near um, Gadsby's Tavern, which is a famous landmark still in Alexandria, Virginia. But around 1810, he and Rachel's brother Isaac Huff, um, who was, by the way, the only witness to their marriage, so that brother and sister must have been very close, but they came to Cincinnati. They came to Ohio to look for land to buy, and they both bought land in Hamilton County. And in the 1810 census in Virginia, John Huff James, I mean Levi James has property in um, Loudoun County and in Hamilton County. So I think you see the beginning of his entrepreneurial skills. So in 1813, they they went to Brownsville, Pennsylvania, got a flatboat, came to Cincinnati, um, and started their life. In fact, by 1814, uh, Levi James was in partnership with a Mr. Douglas and they had a dry goods store. It was then that Levi realized that paying for goods overland from the east was a lot more expensive than by barge from New Orleans. And I think that was probably the beginning of his interest in river traffic. In fact, in 1817, um, the, the barge Eliza of Cincinnati was launched and he and his partner were co-owners of that. What's fascinating to me is that in this day and age we talk about reinventing ourselves and when I researched the history of Levi James I thought what better to describe a man who was, you know, apprenticed out, bound out as they called it, became a successful saddler, bought prop decided to move all the way from Virginia to Ohio, bought property, had a shop, and then got into the steamboat business and became a steamboat pilot as well as an owner. In the 1819 Cincinnati Directory, and I'm going to read this, all the things that are described about Levi James in Cincinnati was um, one of the organizers, as we know, one of the organizers of the Cincinnati, of Cincinnati College and a trustee, and he also helped to organize the Cincinnati Medical College. I think that was because of his brother-in-law, Isaac Huff, who was a doctor. He was listed also as a trustee of the Fund Support of the Poor. He was on the Board of Directors of the Bank of Cincinnati and the Board of Directors of the Cincinnati Insurance Company. So I think he, 
he believes so strongly in education, and I trace it back to that apprenticeship where he not only learned a trade, but he learned maybe rudimentary math and, and um, reading, but enough to have a successful business at every stage of his life. And so um, we pay homage to John Huff James, but the father, Levi, also was an amazing individual. So thank you. That's all about Levi. <laughs> well, no, there's a lot more. About Levi. <laughs> As Ron and I were talking about, you know, get genealogists started, and it's really bad. <laughs> so uh, I like to introduce Shimo to do the closing remarks. Right. Yeah, so thank you. Very much. Jefferson later. I would like to thank the Eaton family again and uh, for entrust, entrusting the University of Cincinnati with this very important piece of their family history. We promise you <laughs> to the best stores possible for those incredible items. So thanks everybody for coming. Have a good day. All right.